Hey, fifth graders, welcome back to another excerpt from Nowhere Boy. Oh, yesterday's reading when we left off. Oh, my goodness. His father's alive and he's looking for him. I hated to stop reading, so let's get right to it. Chapter 47. The playground was so quiet when Ahmed woke that he figured it was still early in the morning. Remember, he's in the slide. He sat up slowly, a little stiff, a little cold, but he had long before become accustomed to sleeping in uncomfortable places. It was only when he poked his head out of the wooden globe and looked up at the sun glinting high over the park that he realized it had to be nearly noon. But the playground was empty. There were no parents or grandparents sitting on the benches, no babies wailing from their strollers, no toddlers shouting up the slides or clamoring up the mound. Ahmed instantly understood. People were afraid to be out. He had fled thousands of kilometers to escape the war, only to find that it wasn't far enough. Kind of like all our playgrounds, although I've noticed recently that, they, that they're being used again. Ahmed put on his backpack, then slid down one of the tube slides. He was too big for it. His hair ne nearly skimmed the top. But in case there was anyone on the other side of the fence, he didn't want to be seen. He had once loved slides, the rush of speed, the uncertainty of the final drop to the asphalt, but now he just felt heavy and had to push himself off the bottom, out of the bottom where the tube flattened out. He was relieved no one was there to see him. A possible terrorist popping out of a slide had to be a Belgian parent's worst nightmare, but it was strange to be alone at a playground on a sunny day like the last living kid in the world. What was Max doing now? He would be back at school if it were open. Of course, he'd be terribly worried, but Ahmed tried not to let his guilt bother him. If the police came, Max could honestly say he had no idea where Ahmed was. Ahmed focused on his plan. He needed to make his way out of the city, perhaps to a larger wooded park where he could hide until everything calmed down. And then he tried not to think too far in the future, one step at a time. His stomach rumbled, and he was thankful for the banana and stale baguette he squirreled away in his bag, but he only allowed himself a few bites of each. Who knew how long he'd need these provisions to last? Then he scaled the playground wall and zigzagged around the ramps of a skate park until he rejoined the gravestone path. He could see more names in the daylight. Augusta, Emile, a la mémoire de Clemence but even the bright sun couldn't illuminate the names that were worn down and faded away. The jingle of a leash made him look up. A small dog trotted over the gravestones, an old woman walking behind him. He knew he should just pass by without making eye contact, but in a flash of panic, he ducked behind a hedge. Only after he heard the woman's footsteps pass and the dog's tinkling leash fade did he allow himself to look around. He was in a small square set off the main path. On a pillar in the center was a life-size statue of a woman with her arm draped around a child. The woman's hair was shorn, meaning cut, and she wore a shapeless dress. The child leaned against her. Ahmed translated the pack, plaque beside them as best he could. So what do you think this, this author intentionally put this scene in? What? The, the Ravensbrook Monument to women of the resistance and their children who died in German camps during World War II. The child represents the painful memory of loss and the struggle to guard children, hope, and the future. Wow, guys, that gave me the chills. Let me read that again. So this statue is in Belgium, in Brussels. The Ravensbrook Monument to women of the resistance and their children who died in German camps during World War II. The child represents the painful memory of loss and the struggle to guard children, hope, and the future. I think Ravensbrück was uh, one of the concentration, was the name of one of the concentration camps. Ahmed scowled at the words, what hope, what future? The women had died, their children too. Nothing was left of them but words hidden in the corner of a park. And yet the woman in the statue stared defiantly over Ahmed's head. 
It was as if she saw something in the distance that Ahmed had failed to imagine or understand. He swiveled around, tried to see it too. Chapter 48. Ahmed? Max stood in front of the dry fountain, hoarse from shouting. On the way back from Molenbeek, he had searched Parc de Cinquantaire, even peeking into the great mosque and the enormous carpeted prayer room. He and Oscar had agreed that it was best to split up the other parks near the house. Oscar, who could get there faster, would go to the larger park, Wolve. I know I'm saying that park wrong, and I apologize, fifth graders. And Max would ride down Avenue Georges Henri to the smaller Georges Henri Park at the bottom of the hill. Ahmed couldn't have gotten far with all the metros and buses shut down. But what if he had hitched a ride? He wouldn't try that after Amir, would he? Hopefully Ahmed hadn't been that desperate. Ahmed! Max shouted again. But the park was empty, save for an old woman walking her dog. She stared at him in an unfriendly way, but Max didn't care. No one was going to stop him from finding Ahmed, not even Ahmed himself. I know you're good at hiding, Max said, but I'm good at finding. He left the fountain and jogged along the path of stone slabs. Ahmed, he shouted. He wasn't giving up. Chapter 49, that was a quick one. Do you think they're going to find each other? Ahmed froze. Someone, was someone calling his name? It was probably just a trick of hunger and longing. But no, there it was again. Ahmed! Ahmed ran back from the memorial to find Max sprinting toward him over the gravestone path. Yay! At the sight of Max racing toward him with a loud whoop, he burst into a smile. He couldn't help it. Deep down, he realized he would wanted to be found. Max skidded to a stop in front of him. He was out of breath, panting. How did you... Ahmed asked. Search different parks, but that's not important. Max grabbed his arm. Your father, he's alive. Ah! It's great. I'm going to cry with the joy of this moment. Ahmed stared at him. Was this even possible? No, something was lost in trans translation. He had to be misunderstanding what Max was saying. Did you hear me, Ahmed? About my father? He's alive. He shook his head. This, this, is, this is not possible. But even as he said this, Ahmed felt a pang of hope. Your friend Abraham Malaki, Malaki, Max panted. He's still in Brussels. Last month, he charged his old phone. He found messages from your dad. The Coast Guard rescued him. He was in a, the hospital in Turkey for weeks, unconscious. By the time he was able to call, the smuggler must have had your phone. He couldn't reach you, so he left messages for Abraham. Max would never lie. Abraham would never lie. It had to be true. Baba was alive. Ah, I have chills. Ahmed's legs crumbled, and he sank onto the gravestone beneath him. Tears rolled down Ahmed's cheeks and splattered against the gravestone. He is still in Turkey? He looked up, but Max had kneeled beside him. No, he's in Europe. He was trying to find you. His last message said he was being arrested and taken to a detention center in Hungary. Oh, no. The sentence landed like a blow. Of all the places in Europe that his father could have ended up, this was the worst. Hungary was the least welcoming country on the refugee route. Ahmed still remembered the hot, crowded Coletti train station in Budapest and the Hungarian police how they would lie to refugees about where they were taking them or even beat them. Oh no. Do you know where? Ibrahim told me the name. He said there was also a re refugee rights group in Hungary that was trying to help him. Ahmed jumped to his feet. I must go to the center now. Max was up beside him, his hand on Ahmed's arm. You can't just go to Hungary. The whole of Europe is on alert, but borders are still open, but borders is still open. I think so, but that doesn't mean there won't be police at them now checking documents. I have Belgian ID, a forged Belgian ID. Max was right. The Schengen Agreement kept borders open between European Union countries, but there would still be heightened security, especially in and out of Belgium. The trip would be incredibly dangerous, but so was the alternative. 
It is no longer safe for me here. Yesterday, after attack, Inspector Fontaine sees me leave school alone. He asked directrice questions. Is that why you took off? Ahmed nodded. I must go right now. Max crossed his arms over his chest. You can't go. Max! Alone. You want to go with me? Ahmed asked, but he already knew the answer. It made him want to hug Max and tell him to forget about it at the same time. We'll be less suspicious together. I have real papers and I can do the talking. Yikes. What Max really meant was that having a white European looking schoolboy by his side would make Ahmed seem like less of a threat. Isn't that sad, fifth graders? White privilege. Ahmed couldn't argue with this, but Max would make the journey riskier in other but Max would make the journey riskier in other ways. Boy like me, people not worry if he travels alone. But boy like you, in America maybe, but parents here allow kids to be more independent, especially in groups. My scout overnight next month doesn't even have adults going. Just the leaders who are like 16. Max's face brightened. Hey, I know. We can dress in scout uniforms, pretend we're going on a trip. No one will suspect anything. Everyone loves the scoots. But your family, they will worry. They will call police. Max took out his phone and began to type. A moment later, he held up the screen so Ahmed could see. Look, Hungary is 14 hours by train. We can catch a 9.20 tomorrow morning to Frankfurt. That's the first leg. I'll pretend to go to school. And by the time anyone even starts to miss me, we'll be halfway to Hungary. Oh, good Lord. They are not actually considering going to another country that does not welcome refugees by themselves. Oh, my goodness. This was the same Max who had come up with a plan to sneak him into the School of Happiness. The same crazy, wonderful, naive, hopeful Max. But Ahmed shook his head. No, I cannot ask this of you. You don't get it, do you, Max said. He sounded almost angry. I owe you. Owe me? My whole life. I felt so useless, like I wasn't good at anything, like all I did was screw up. You made me feel, Max looked down, his face flushed, like I could help. Ahmed smiled. Boy hero. Remember the books they had been reading about the, the short stories about the boy heroes during World War II? Or was it one? No, Max said quietly, just a sidekick to one. Oh, he's calling Ahmed the hero. Excuse me, the hero. Ahmed couldn't speak, so he looked into the distance. The way the statue had... Sorry, Ahmed couldn't speak, so he looked into the distance, the way the statue had, and concentrated on blinking back tears. Come on, Nabil Fwazi, Max said with a grin. You'll stay with me tonight in my room. The metro still isn't running. I'll tell my mom you need to sleep over. But Fontaine, Ahmed managed to choke out. He won't figure out where we are that fast, especially with everything else going on. Plus, he already came by once today. I doubt he'll be back. What do you think? Oh, my goodness. They're really getting into it now, fifth graders. So um, make sure you – that's the end of the three chapters. That was a quick one today. But make sure you um, share your thinking in the shared drive, all right? And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, sweet kids.